recording in progress. Got it. Morning. Aloha. Welcome, everybody. We're just going to wait another minute or so to let everybody get settled into the meeting. If you can hear me, I uh, would appreciate if everybody could mute your microphones, at least for now. And if you have a video camera or your phone camera, um, it would be good if we could see everybody's faces. No. Okay, I've got 601. Uh, why don't we get started? First of all, welcome to the Eva Beach Homestead Project Master Plan and Environmental Assessment Project. This is our first beneficiary consultation meeting on this project, and just glad that everybody could join us tonight. Uh, we're going to get started with the pule. So at this time, I want to ask Lehua Kinilao Kano to lead us in a pule. Uh, Lehua, you might be muted. Sorry. Mahalo, Jared. Just want to say aloha, everyone. And I just want to ask if everyone can just bow their heads and if we can join in prayer together, just we're just so grateful heavenly father for this day and the many blessings and for gathering us together today to talk about this ever beach homestead project which many of us are excited about we just ask for your continued blessings and guidance today and to have a fruitful discussion and creation of a homestead community that will bring bring people together and bring families together and to just be an example of your love and your work here. And again, we just thank everyone who took the time to be here this evening. We ask blessings for those that are here and those who are unable to attend, but are very interested. And we just ask for your continued guidance as we work together to have a fruitful discussion this evening. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, let's go back to the slideshow. Um, we just have a slide with the team. And in, in the interest of time, so everybody on this slide from DHHL and SSFM are on the call. Um, we're being led by a project manager at DHHL, Perlene Fukuba. Uh, our project manager at SSFM, we're the prime consultant working with the department. Uh, Melissa May is our project manager. <coughs> um, we also have Malachi Khrushchev. He's a planner with us. And I'm Jared Chang, also a planner at SSFM. I'll be facilitating tonight's meeting. Okay, so meeting objectives. So we want to make sure you guys see our faces <laughs> and get to know us. Um, so we want to introduce the project team. Um, we're going to provide an overview of the project, how we got to this point. Um, what we've completed so far and where we're going in the future. And then the rest of the meeting, we want to gather input from everybody on the call to see what your thoughts are on how this new homestead community should look. Um, essentially, it's uh, equivalent to visioning for this, this project. So early stages of the vision for the project. Okay, our kuleana for all of us tonight. Um, we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to participate and share their mana'o with us and the team. Um, I, I would like to ask if you have a camera to turn your camera on. Uh, and when you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Um, we want everybody to be respectful. Please don't talk over others. Um, when you do want to speak, raise your hand either in your video and let me see it and acknowledge you or you can use the Zoom function to raise your hand. So I'll cover that in the next, um, next slide. Some other 
Kuliana for everybody. Sometimes we have to agree to disagree, um, but let's just all be respectful to other perspectives if we hear them tonight. And sharing the floor. So if, if you've spoken on a topic and I've called on you, um, let's try to give other people a chance to speak to if, if we can, otherwise wait for me to call back on you before you speak again. Okay, Zoom instructions. So for most of you, if you're on your computer, starting on the left side of your screen, you'll see that microphone button. That's how you mute and unmute yourself. In the center of the screen is the chat button. Um, you can click on that to open up the chat window. Uh, we, we do encourage people to use the chat, um, but I would only ask that you don't have full on sidebar conversations in the chat. And what we really like everybody to do is, is speak you know, through the microphone so we can hear your voice. We will try to get to the chat. If you ask questions in the chat, I'll try to get to it, but uh, no promises. It depends on how much um, people are speaking and how much entries into the chat there are. Next to that on the right is the reactions button. That's how you get to raise your hand. Um, so you click on that button, then you click to raise your hand and just remember to lower your hand after you've spoken. Otherwise I'll keep calling on you. Okay, so tonight we're also using a, a Mentimeter. And so this is an online survey tool and hopefully you are able to get onto it using your phone or web browser in addition to being on the call. But if you go to menti.com on your web browser and you enter this code 8169192, it'll take you to the set of questions that we're gonna be asking during the meeting so that we can start to gauge um, your thoughts and your mana'o. Uh, don't feel pressured like you have to get on it some guys won't be able to uh, so what we want to do is just use it as a discussion tool to get a feeling for what the the thoughts are in the room um, at this time if you can either go to menti.com in your web browser or you can take a picture of that qr code on the screen to open it up and we have a, a pretty simple warm-up question set up you can go ahead and answer that question um, it's just asking, I think, where you're calling in from and uh, what kind of a beneficiary, maybe. Um, but for those of you on the call where your name is a number or it says just iPhone, hopefully you can go in there and change your name so that when I call on you, I know what to, to say. Um, at this time, hopefully, so we're going to show the results of the first Menti question in the next slide. And then we'll get an idea, you know, who's in the room and how many guys are able to get onto Menti. If you can't get onto Menti, actually for all of you, what, what we would like to see is if you guys can open up the chat, um, put your name and where you're calling in from into the chat, just so we have an idea who's in the room with us. So far we have three people on the Menti. Okay, four, one less C. Looks like we got three on the waiting list. One other. And in the room, we have uh, 32 people on the call. So five. Okay, looks like a couple of you got on. You know, let's not waste too much time on this, but uh, for the rest of you, I'm going to ask that Malakai from our team put into the chat the link to Menti and the code so that during the call you can you can try and get on because we're going to be using Minty in the, the latter part of the meeting. And, and mahalo to you guys putting your names and where you're calling in from into the chat. Uh, oh, Malika already put in the Minty and the code. Okay, great. Oh, some Eva Beach, North Carolina, cool. Makaha, Eva Beach, Mililani, Kupaka, Pu'uloa. Cool. All right. So hopefully we can get through the menti tonight. Um, at that, at this point, we're going to go right into the overview of the project. So we have a presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Melissa May Vegas. from our from our office. Um, for for those of you guys that are not muted, uh, let's see if we can get you guys muted. Otherwise, I'm going to go into to Zoom and uh, just mute you guys myself. So don't feel offended.
Aloha, Melissa, you ready? everyone. Um, thanks, Jared. I'm Melissa May. I'm with SSFM. I'm a planner and uh, happy to be working on this project and worked on several DHHL homestead projects over the last few years. Um, so this, this one is exciting. All right, let's go into the presentation. So this property is at the Mackay end of Fort Weaver Road in Eva Beach. And you can see a photo here of where it's located. It wraps around the existing uh, USGS uh, Magnetic Observatory site. And, and then on the other side, it's bordered by the Golf cl Club on the Northeast. Um, and around the site is mostly single family homes and low rise development, um, mostly residential. And it's about 80 acres total. Next slide. So this isn't the only um, existing or future homestead in the area. There's several others, as you probably are familiar, in Kapolei um, and uh, north of the project site. This one is the most uh, closest to the ocean and also farthest from H1. It's about 6.3 miles to the H1 on-ramp at Fort Weaver. And you can see the other existing homesteads and the Ka'ulu Kahai homestead also has some future development <clears throat> that are, is still gonna be happening going forward. Next slide. That's still gonna be happening going forward. So this slide just shows some of the destinations that are around the project site. You can see the orange line is, the dotted line is about a quarter mile. We think of that as a five minute walk. The middle line is a half mile, which is about a 10 minute walk. And then the yellow line is one mile. And so you can see within that vicinity, there's several schools, library, shopping center, post office, and then a little beyond that, there's some medical services and some more um, retail and things like that. So it's definitely in the middle of a lot of destinations and convenient to them. Next slide. So really the intent of this project is to address uh, the waiting list and to provide residential homesteads to beneficiaries on the residential waiting list for Oahu. And uh, the hope is that this will be a thriving homestead community in Eva Beach that honors the culture, environment, and sense of place. And we really would like in this process to involve lessees, as well as waiting list applicants and the surrounding Eva Beach community in shaping what this community is going to look like. And that really starts tonight with you folks. So next slide. Recording in progress. Project task. So this is what is on our plate as the project team working on this project. Um, we're developing a master plan and environmental assessment to get this project permitted. And right now we're working on an infrastructure analysis, making sure that infrastructure like water, sewer, drainage, electrical, and will be available to the site. We're also looking at traffic. Uh, we'll be developing master plan alternatives as part of the, what we hear from you, um, your input. And we'll also be doing environmental compliance like archeology, span biological surveys. And then the community engagement program really runs throughout the project and it'll include meetings with beneficiaries as well as um, different community organizations, elected officials and community members. And this is what the schedule looks like. We're trying to get this done as quickly as possible. Um, it's about 18 months, which is actually pretty ambitious for a master plan in EA. And that's because this is a priority project for the department. We know that this is a you know, desirable area. And uh, this is one of the projects that's going to be funded by the recent funding that was given to DHHL by the legislature. So we're really hoping to get this project um, going so that we can uh, hand it off to design and construction and get homesteads developed for, for lessees. So this is generally what it looks like right now. We're at beneficiary meeting one. There's going to be two more throughout the process, as well as two meetings that are open to the wider community. And there's also going to be a survey that's going to be mailed out to all applicants on the Oahu waiting list to get your input on what you'd like to see here and on the alternatives. So prior to this, um, this, uh, this site was actually acquired by DHHL. It wasn't part of the original 
uh, land that were granted to DHHL. So uh, what happened was in 2020, there was a notice of availability, availability issued that said this land was becoming available. And um, there was a presentation to the Hawaiian Homes Commission about the possibility of acquiring the land. And then DHHL did due diligence to determine um, whether the site was suitable for homesteading and other possible uses. There was a survey done, um, and then DHHL determined that uh, they would like to acquire the property and they issued an intent to accept. They got the deed in 2021, and then this year, earlier this year, we kicked off this project. And then I'll hand it off to Malachi for um, some of the results of things we've heard so far. So uh, mahalo, uh, Melissa. Uh, my name is Malachi Krishak. Uh, I'm a planner with SSFM. Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the initial site investigations uh, and background information that will hopefully help us with that visioning piece that we're going to jump into after this that Jared mentioned. So, uh, so Melissa mentioned prior to DHL acquiring this property in 2020, uh, the department did investigate the parcel and the surroundings. Um, so this investigation included a, uh, acquiring a title report, surveyor's report, um, preparing a phase one environmental site assessment uh, to determine you know, potential of on-site contaminants. This is this be based on the past uses on the site. Also completed a magnetometer survey um, to determine potential presence of unexploded ordinances underground on the site. And uh, the department also uh, required uh, evaluation of whether the existing structures or the buildings on site, looking at the architecture piece of it, um, were historic and whether the impact, there'd be impacts to them. And this was um, determined uh, to be no impact by the architecture branch of SHPD. Um, <clears throat> they also reviewed uh, you know, initial look at the flood zone, tsunami, sea level rise projections for the area, which we'll get into a little bit more, and took an early look at uh, infrastructure capacity. And again, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next couple slides. So for this project, um, this is just the list of technical studies that we're kicking off as part of that master planning and environmental compliance tasks. Um, so the preliminary engineering report is well underway. Uh, we have some initial findings to share with you folks, as well as the traffic impact assessment report, which we know is important, especially for this area. Um, we also have consultants working on uh, archaeological literature review and field investigation, as well as a cultural impact assessment to be included in the EA. And we actually, this past weekend, they just completed the biological survey, so we do have some initial findings for that. And then uh, throughout the project, we'll also be looking at um, the need for soil testing, any additional hazardous material investigation on the site that comes up, and taking a closer look at um, some of the climate change, the flooding, and sea level rise impacts um, to the project site as well. So here are some preliminary findings that um, we have to share that hopefully help kind of frame the, the site and help us as we begin our visioning of what we want to see there. Um, so the city of Honolulu uh, Board of Water Supply has, has confirmed that water is available for the project site. Uh, in terms of wastewater, so sewers, the city wastewater branch is currently evaluating kind of sewer capacity um, and giving us the thresholds and whatnot. Um, but in the due diligence, they did um, acknowledge that there is, there is capacity in the area. Um, also, um, from that preliminary uh, engineering reports, there is a recommendation that the designs aim to retain stormwater runoff in terms of drainage. Um, it's kind of a best practice, especially since we're close to the ocean and some of the geology in the area. And then uh, from the biological survey, uh, they're over there this weekend and um, they found that there's no endangered or threatened plants or any endangered or threatened animals observed on the site. They also look specifically at pu'eo, a pu'eo habitat um, and desirable habitat. So potential uh, for pu'eo to um, um, to nest there in the future. Um, they found that there is none. Um, and then but they did find some rare plants um, around uh, some, some locations. They're not endangered, but they are rare. So I want to consider including that into our, our, um, our design or finding ways to mitigate that um, in, the, in the site planning process too. 
So for traffic, um, this is a preliminary look at um, the traffic engineers did a tra travel time analysis. So looking at the project site and the, um, the trip basically from the H1 down Fort Reaver Road, uh, which is, as Melissa mentioned is about 6.3 miles. So the current conditions, uh, I'm sure as folks who live in the area know, there's traffic. Uh, you know, it can take up to 27 minutes, around half an hour uh, under current conditions with traffic. Um, without traffic, it can be, you catch all the lights, it could, it could be uh, as low as like 16 minutes. Um, so they also looked at what it would look like at a maximum site to build out. And this means basically the maximum physical um, capacity of the site to house as many units as possible, as many people as possible. So adding all those cars to the road, they found that it would add an additional uh, about four minutes, excuse me, of travel time um, along Fort Reaver Road and during those peak traffic hours. And then moving into the preliminary findings um, around sea level rise and the uh, tsunami um, evacuation zones. So in the blue here on this map, you see the sea level rise exposure area. Um, this is kind of the state standard projection of what uh, sea level rise impacts would be at 3.2 feet of sea level rise. And it takes in passive flooding, uh, annual high, high wave, as well as erosion. Um, you can see some parts of the lower portion of the site closest, um, the high parts of the site are, are impacted by that, as well as the tsunami evacuation zone, which you can see with the, the red hatching. So something to be aware of. And here is a map looking at the flood zones um, in the area. So uh, along the coastline, you can see the red zone VE. That is a high hazard zone. Um, that's outside of the project site. But then in the purple, we have zone X. And zone X is considered a moderate, a low to moderate flood hazard. Uh, so areas with less than a 1% chance of annual flooding, but it is considered um, you know, a very low, uh, a low to moderate flood hazard area. Um, and then in the yellow, kind of the other portion of the site and, and surrounding areas is undetermined flood zone, so flood zone D. So those are the preliminary findings kind of um, provide some context for the site. Um, of course, we're going to continue the investigations and the environmental assessment will look closer at these um, you know, technical uh, reports and take these considerations in. Um, but we did want to share them as we get into the visioning and master planning piece. I think that's my that's where I'm leaving off, and I'll pass it back to Jared to facilitate this next this next part. Okay, on this slide, we're showing um, basically how to provide input and stay informed. Uh, so the department is planning <clears throat> a applicant mail survey. Uh, <clears throat> in the January to March of next year timeframe. Um, we are looking at tentatively having the second beneficiary consultation meeting in May of 2023 and the third one in October of 2023. So for this one, we're trying to collect input on the visioning, get as much ideas about what the site could look like, be and feel like right now. Um, between this meeting and the next one, we are gonna be trying to come up with some master plan alternatives um, to present at a workshop and refine at the next meeting. And then in the third meeting in October, we would be looking at the final master plan um, and the EA. Uh, for some other non-beneficiary consultation meetings that we're doing, um, there's gonna be a community meeting open to the public in January. Um, and beneficiary consultation number two. Help me with that, Alyssa. For, for July. I actually think that's supposed to say community meeting number two. <laughs> right, yeah, so that's, that's a, so there'd be two community meetings. So the first one would be in January and the second one would be July. So this is to involve the greater public of Eva Beach. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead. At this time, um, this is kind of the midpoint of our meeting. So the rest of this meeting, we wanna use it in discussion and hear from you guys, but I wanna pause for no longer than maybe 10 minutes uh, to give an opportunity. If anybody on the call has any questions about um, what was just presented. So any technical questions that you, you have 
and you either can raise your hand in your video or use the raise your hand function in Zoom. Alicia, I see your hand went up. Go ahead, you can unmute yourself. Hey, I, uh, my name's Alicia Malofiti. My dad's on the, um, on the list and my family has homestead in Papakolea and, and down in Waianae. I live three houses away from the entry to the Tsunami Warning Center on Fort Weaver Road. I, I have a lot of concerns and I'm just trying to figure out um, how, does the, how does this effort address those concerns? And the one thing I wanted to ask you was, did you guys take a look at the firing range? And this morning, 7 a.m., it starts at six, by the way, with, the, um, with their announcements, 7 a.m. till about noon, nonstop firing. I, I mean, I can't believe, I mean, you guys, I mean, you guys are gonna have to do something about that. We have not been able to get them to move their firing range. Have you guys been down here and heard this? It's pretty bad. Okay. Uh, the well, the traffic would be as addressed as part of the EA. That's that's normal, and it's. I'm glad you brought up the firing range. Uh, that is something that affects the whole community down there. Uh, so so noise impacts on the homes there will have to be looked at in the EA too. Thank you for that. Okay. Did, did we have anyone else? Um, oh, somebody from the DHHO office, a participant there has a, a question. Um, Where are you guys? Go, go ahead. Yeah, um, for that, the traffic, how the traffic wise, where um, the house is going to be, is it going to be like in the middle of the traffic or going to be away from it? Like um, if the traffic, because I know how they cars and stuff. So at this moment in time, we don't have um, a concrete plan of how the new community is going to look like. That, that is one of the purposes of why we're having these meetings tonight is we want people to help us shape the new community and to take into consideration some of the potential concerns that the surrounding community might have. Um, so I guess that my question for you is what would what what do you think would work best um, based on your question? Let us know what you think would work best. Um, would it where where sh where should um, ingress and egress to the parcel be located? Uh, I'm not too sure, but I'm kind of worried about the traffic. Okay, All right. I, yeah, I think. We're all acknowledging that the you know traffic in Ava Beach is an issue, um, certainly one that can't be ignored. So the impacts that this project will have on traffic will be very important as to consider as we go forward. I don't see any other hands up. What, let's just move into uh, the next part of this meeting. Uh, we we basically want to try and get everyone's input on a number of uh, ideas and concepts. So community character. Um, the residential land uses, community land uses, transportation, and um, you know what to do in the hazard zone. So we're going to be going through those five kind of categories of ideas and trying to get input on each one of them. So at this time, um, let's just go to the first slide in this section. So we have a we're going back to the Mentimeter polling site. And if, if you guys had gone through this already, you would have seen this question and been able to answer it. So we're just trying to get some general high level ideas on what the Elva Beach Homestead community, the homestead um, one. what looks like to you. Looks like we still have about four people on the Menti. So I'm gonna, oh, Malachi already posted the, uh, website and the code to put in to get back onto the Menti. I would encourage everybody, if you can, to go, go to your web browser, put in menti.com, put in that code, and then um, we can have you guys participate in the Menti. So while we're looking at some of the responses that have come in, I'm going to open it up for a discussion. I'm going to spend some time just hearing from everybody on the call. Um, 
well, your your description of what the homestead community should look like to you. Anybody wants to go? Any hands? Am I missing any? I Aloha. can't see everybody's. Uh, Aloha. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I see you. Go ahead. Yeah. Aloha. So my name is Kuenani Eaton. I um, live right on the other side of Alicia on Ever Beach Road near the Kai. Um, and I guess addressing this question, it kind of goes back to what you guys said, the the previous one. I kind of goes back to, I was wondering who did your folks' like, biological study and cultural impact for the there's kupuna in this area, like my ohana is from here. So I was wondering who you folks like reached out to, like different ohana Hawaii who already live here. Um, I, I guess this is, would be a step, right? These kind of meetings. Um, but I was curious, like who did your folks is like, who's your archeologist and things like that. Um, and if you folks had anybody on your team that was actually from this area. Um, yeah. But, but as far as this question, I would like to see more, um, involving of finding out like the kupuna and kanaka hawaii who live here um in in, in kind of like this planning because i i think in, on here i think it's only alicia and i that actually live um in this area right here so yeah that was my question okay for our biological study on the team we have geometrician associates um dr ron terry he's he's really good but he's from the big island uh, doing our cultural impact assessment is Honua Consulting, Trisha Kehaulani Watson. And, you know, that that's not completed. That's just kind of getting started now. So what we would like to ask at this time is if you know people that we should be speaking to, Kupuna, what have you from the area, we are, you know, you're more than welcome to provide that information to us so that we, we are more informed and, you know, can go reach out to those guys. Oh, okay. So if I know, I know Kehal. Um, is that somebody I could just shoot Manao out to? If, if she's you have speak. her contact and everything, of, of course, yes. Okay. okay. Any other hands up? Hopefully everybody is okay using the Zoom raise your hand function. Okay, I see a hand up. Let me see. Raymond, go ahead. Yeah, um, Yeah. my name is uh, Raymond Kahola. You know, I, I've been on the Hawaiian home with Lisa for many years now, over 30 years. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, the, the impact statement of that area, you know, I just listened to my sisters over there talking and about why is the Hawaiian homeless is right next to military and using firing range. I mean, that's, see, I don't think that's a good idea that Hawaiian homeland is right there and they use in target practice. I mean, it's just like being on core lobby or something. You know what I mean? They bombing away and not on top of that, they're shooting away. But um, why is it Hawaiian homelands is putting Kanaka Maulis on that land over there in an impact statement? I mean, um, it's kind of like on Kupuna standpoint, no makes sense. You know, you put in Hawaiians inside that area over there. And yeah, I just can see it's like we stay in flood zones. I mean, wow, you know what I mean? Where you gonna put the connectors? Where in the corner over there? I don't think that's right, home. In homelands, you guys gotta do a better job than that. And you know, because hey, I've been waiting on the list for a long time. And still you're not can get in. Why? You know, that's the whole thing about it. How come? You know? Um, so I don't I don't see really a good idea on that corner. And we stay in the flood zone, we stay in tsunami zone, we stay in firing range. See, oh, wait, you guys. But as you, I mean, how I know that you guys got to do a better job than that, okay? Oh, thank you for those comments. You know, I, I, I Hard to say. Uh, from my point of view, you know, um, the Oahu wait list is the longest and Oahu has the least amount of available lands to build homes. So the opportunity to build homes, I think Hawaiian homelands is, is doing their best. Um, but understand your comments that you made about the, the firing range and proximity to that too. So that's, that's stuff that we take uh, seriously when we get to evaluating the impacts of the community on this 
development and and vice versa. Good. Anyone else? Um, Alicia, I see your hand up too, but if nobody else is raising their hand, go ahead. Go ahead, Alicia. You know, I here's where I am. I am not loving the project. Um, but I, I can at least understand that we need homes for Hawaiians. And so in that respect, I hope that we can move the project forward, but address all the concerns. And I would love to see you guys, if you're serious about this project, freaking shut down that firing range. There's absolutely no reason that these guys should be firing over here, surrounded by residential. Hey, 50, 60 years ago, I, I, got, I heard it from the neighborhood board. Oh, they were here long before you moved in. I don't care how long they were there. It's no longer the proper place to have a firing range with all of us living around. I think DHHL and the rest of the Hawaiians on this island can finally do something about getting the military out of that area. They're t that is beachfront. Do you see on the map? That's beachfront. And all they do every morning, every night is fire those, the target practice. So if the best thing that comes out of this project is homes for Hawaiians, the second best thing is getting rid of that firing range. I don't think you can do this project so long as that firing range is still going. So I, whoever your consultants are, I would put that first on the list. Honestly, with all the traffic, traffic is gonna be second next to that firing range. You will not, you will not be able to sleep with that firing range next door. Ma Mahalo for sharing the, your concerns about the firing range. I think now that DHHL is gonna be playing a more active role in the region, we can definitely um, reach out to the military and express um, those concerns um, so that uh, the Eva Beach community for our, our beneficiaries um, will not have to be um, exposed to those issues. But, you know, it is the military, it's not DHHL, but we will try our best to reach out to the military um, to understand um, the issue better and um, make sure that it we can we can start the conversation to see how um, that activity can be mitigated and not cause a big impact to our future community. Anybody else have have thoughts on what this community should uh, strive to be? Why don't we try the next question, which gets into a little bit more detail, um, provide some some options to see what, what we can prioritize or what the community priorities are. That one's good to have 20 minutes. All right, so the question was, what are your top concerns when thinking about the future Ever Beach Homestead community? And there was a, a bunch of options on there. I don't know if you guys can read all of that, but I'll just read over what the options were. <clears throat> Commute time, traffic congestion, crime, safety, sea level rise, flooding, and coastal. Oh, here it is. Okay. Sea level rise, flooding, and coastal hazards, uh, access to medical and other emergency facilities, cost of living, cost of maintenance or association fees access to schools, pedestrian and bicycle safety, community appearance and amenities, having a range of housing options, environmental and cultural resource protection, sustainability such as renewable energy or energy efficiency, um, ability to conduct cultural practices on site and share cultural and place-based knowledge, community relationships and gathering places, connection to the surrounding of a beach community or other. So those are the options we gave and we gave you an option to write in something that we missed maybe. Um, but let's try to take a look at the results. So, so far only four of you guys have answered and we have roughly about 30 something people on the call. So far six. 
Wow. Okay. Yeah, eight right now. What do you five people anchoring? I'm gonna make my screen bigger. Okay. Nine. So we got nine guys. <clears throat> So, looks like top concerns, crime and safety and sustainability have, have received six votes. And then we got four categories that got five votes. So that's commute time and traffic congestion, cost of living, bills, cost of maintenance and association fees, similar. The other five is the ability to conduct cultural practices and share cultural and place-based knowledge. Uh, no votes for access to schools or pedestrian and bicycle safety. Um, range of housing options, everything else, kind of a three. So hopefully you guys can see this too, but I did wanna ask everyone, you know, what, how does this sound you know, how's, for the guys that couldn't participate in Menti, you know, how does this sound as priorities for this this future community, Homestead community? Opening it up for any any discussion right now. So any amount of what we're taking. Does anybody want to chime in? Okay, Raymond, I see I see your hand up again. Sorry if I missed anybody else. I cannot see everybody's screen at once. So Raymond, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, um, if that uh, the community area and where um, you have access to the schools, yeah, I, I, it's a really good uh, um, idea that's close to the schools where, you know, um, the Kikis can get to school. Like uh, the only ones I see around is um, Ever Beach and, and um, Campbell, yeah, and there's two schools right in that area, um, um, elementary schools, yeah. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you know, is is that gonna be um, a hazard for any of you know when this project come up? Is are we, are they gonna deal with a lot of traffic in that area? Because as far as I see down in uh, down in uh, that road, man, you get congestion over there. How's it going with this traffic, with this uh, new uh, housing development coming out in, in that area? Uh, how's that gonna affect the, the surrounding community with um, extra houses down there? And, you know, how are you gonna deal with all that traffic in that area? Which is, can be really congested in that area, you know? when school start and can be also dangerous, um, you know, for a lot of the Kikis going to school and stuff. So right. that's my address on that. Yeah, th that is something we are taking a close look at, you know, safe access to schools in the future. So how we lay this out will be pretty important and what connections we make to the sidewalks and roadways will also be important. Uh, Alicia, I saw your hand up. Go ahead. You know, only because Raymond brought it up about the schools. I, I know you guys are doing all of these, you know, all the surveys and all of the research. Oh my God, Campbell is one of the biggest schools on the entire island. I mean, their graduating classes are maxed out already. And Maybe the biggest. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's so overcrowded. And you know, um, Haseko had to build that new middle school over on their side of, of on Ocean Point. I mean, I'm gonna just assume that DHHL is gonna have to contribute at some level to improve the schools in this area because you cannot put more kids over in, in Campbell High School or Elima Intermediate or Pohaku, I think is, um, I'm not sure the elementary, two elementary schools right there. I mean, everybody is maxed out down here on the way, on, in Eva Eva Beach, so um, to Raymond's concern, but not getting to the school is the problem. Actually, getting into the school is going to be the problem. 
Right. And as part of that process, you know, DOE is definitely one of the agencies that will be consulted. Um, how they determine where, where new developments, what schools they go to, uh, kind of comes at a later time. But it is something that we, we are looking at as part of this process, for sure. And it has come up in our discussions so far. Anybody else? Nobody's been using the Zoom raise your hand function. Oh, uh, why not? Go ahead. Yeah, um, Aloha. I, my, one of my concerns is I was thinking of where Alicia lives. She lives on Fort Weaver. And there's a lot of the Ohana there who park their cars on, on the DHHL side, on the tsunami side. So I was just wondering how, you know, DHHL would be working with, you know, the, the older community. You know, like, will those parkings still be available for all those Ohana? Um, you know, it's on the tsunami side, right? And that's a lot of families that live here right, right now that park on that side. So that was one concern. Yeah, I can't ignore it. You know, we know guys been parking on over there in front of this parcel for a long time. And, you know, it is something that will be addressed and hopefully worked out. But we don't, we don't know at this time, right? We're just at the beginning stages and trying to get through the planning. Um, but yes, thank you for bringing that up. We are very aware of that issue. Uh, Lucille, I see your hand up. Go ahead. You're, oh, you're still muted, though. Okay, uh, well, my concern um, whenever there's a new project is the lighting, the lighting for the streets. Uh, we do have um, people that like to walk at night to exercise, but my concern is the lighting because I know a lot of these spaces, the lighting is not that great. Um, so that's one of my concerns. Um, and I'll, I'll let it go at that. But that's one of my concerns. Thank you. Yeah, very good. How about for some of you guys that participated in the Menti? Looks like there was uh, 12 of you guys, you know. Um, for the ones that you picked as your either number one or number two top concerns, anybody willing to share why, why that was a concern for you? You know, either it was the cost uh, of maintenance or... You know, traffic. Shoot, I can't see picture? this. Can we show your picture too? Uh, how about the sustainability? That was another high one. Um, use of renewable energies and, and stuff like that. Anybody want to share? Oh, okay. DHHO, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Uh, Steve, if you wanted to share the, your response that you oh, gave on this. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, you couldn't hear you. Um, oh, something, but can you come back? I come back to you. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem. Anybody else that um, participated in the Menti? This one. I'll give you a picture. Yeah. Uh, I see a hand up. Emily, oh, why? Hey. Go ahead. Uh, yes, um, my concern is no one said nothing about the noise from the airplanes. <laughs> is, isn't that the area that the airplane goes over? Yes. But you can't do anything about that. You, you can't do anything, but it's something to be concerned about for some people. <laughs> <clears throat> right. I mean, there's... Uh... You know, Keokaha in Big Island has to deal with the airport also. And there are ways to mitigate against noise. You know, you, you have uh, air conditioning or you have different materials for your walls. Uh, so that would be something that we, we would be looking at too. You know, impacts from the planes that fly over there, which which happens, you know, right on a, every day. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, I got a couple more hands up. Uh, let's go with Kavai. Uh, oh. Hey. Back to Lucio and then Wainani. Okay, go ahead. Goodbye. Uh, aloha. I'm from in Utah. And the concern that I have, I think you brought up, um, is is the traffic. Is there are there anything that would sort of open up the traffic? I know that there's the traffic there is horrible. Oh, I have a a cousin that lives in that area, and it seems like 
it takes forever to get to anywhere. Um, and my concern when you're having some kind of medical problem, with the traffic there might be dead by the time you get to the hospital. So, you know, I, I mean, it, that, that is my biggest concern is how do, how do we sort of correct that or to make it so it, it would be more, the flow of the traffic would be more um, available to, for the people who live there. So it's, it's a question or for everyone that's on your board to be able to answer it, so. I can tell you we don't have an answer now, but, mm -hmm. but we are looking at the traffic as part of the master plan as well as the EA, the environmental assessment. Um, you know, traffic is a major issue on Fort Weaver, uh, no question about it. And so, you know, we're not, we have to, we have to take a very close look at it, you know, as we go forward with this. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see, I said, um, what did I say, Wainani and then Lucio? Yes. Uh, Wait, you said why not? No, oh, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, well, the, my, my first thing is um, as far as the traffic goes, we all know that no matter what we do, what we build, there will always be traffic. And then if there is an emergency, if people would move on the side when they hear the emergency vehicles, it shouldn't take that long. But some people just don't know how to move on the side. If you think about who's ever in that uh, emergency vehicle, um, if that was your family, would you want them to get to the hospital or wherever on time? Then you would move on the side. The thing is, people don't think um, about that kind of. So if if the emergency vehicles are going through and you get on the side, you'll get there when you're supposed to, and not fight traffic. You shouldn't be fighting traffic. And my second thing is the cost of living. As we know, cost of living goes up all the time, no matter what. Um, if there are times where people, um, their finances isn't all that great. However, you have to qualify to get into the, the Hawaiian homes. I thought that these homes were supposed to be for the Hawaiians, no matter what your income. Um, isn't that why we have these these homes and why um, the only Hawaiians can qualify for it? That's my questions. Yeah, good questions. Um, I think. Go ahead, yeah, I'll, 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 for the um, first question. Yes, these homes are meant for our Native Hawaiian beneficiaries and only our Native Hawaiian beneficiaries. But I hear from your second question about affordability is that you would like um, the department to provide something that is affordable, something that is um, way less than um, what is currently being offered. So I think as we go through our planning process, we will definitely take into consideration um, that concern about making sure that what we do offer, um, um, we, we look at the affordability of that, that product. But at this time, because we are at the very, be very beginning of the planning process, you know, we, we don't know what the product or what, what, the, what the community is going to look like. We don't know what the product is. The purpose of having this, these conversations is to get mana'o, like you just said, um, about you know having something that is affordable for our Native Hawaiian beneficiaries. So thank you for your comment. Agreed. Why not? Go ahead. And then we're gonna move to the next question. Okay. Um, my other concern, I guess that that was one of the I think that's the sustainability would be mm -hmm. the VAI, the water issue. Um, you know, because of the Red Hill issue that came up, we had a problem right next door in Kapilina, that's in Iroquois Point. And I'm, you know, just make sure that you folks, that's right there. And you have people, I have friends too that got sick from the water and all of that kind of stuff. So um, it's, a, it's a really serious issue and we're right on this side. So um, that would be my concern regarding the VAI. Good. Good issue, good point, good point. Yep. 
Okay, let's move on. The next question set of, well, this is one question, but we want to get an idea of what residential options we should provide, the department should provide at this site. Uh, so same type of mentee question, we give you a list uh, of options. Um, for those of you guys on mentee, uh, hopefully you can go ahead and answer the question and we can start to see the results and see if it uh, resonates with everybody else in the meeting and and get back into our discussion. So what residential op options would you like to see in the Ever Beach Homestead community, this, this future community? Single family turnkey houses? Oh, okay. Um, I'll just read it off for everybody. Single family turnkey houses, single family vacant lot slash owner build, uh, single family rentals, Townhouses in duplex or fourplex, multifamily low slash medium rise apartment, multifamily high rise apartment, multifamily rental, kupuna rental housing, Bye. rent with the option to purchase or other. So let's take a look at the results. So let's see, single family turnkey had six, seven. Um, well, single family turnkey and single family vacant lot slash owner build had seven and looks like rent with the option to purchase got eight votes. So got the most zero for high rise apartment. No, no surprise. Um, how many we got 12? I think we had about 13 guys on the mentee last time. Um, five for Kupuna rental housing and five for single family rentals. So it's, you know, if I'm taking a look at this, um, looks like either single family turnkey or single family vacant lots, kind of the preferred single family type lot uh, or rent with the option to purchase. I suppose that could apply uh, to single family or multifamily. So having a rental option to purchase is important. Uh, if we were looking at multifamily, it's not going to be a high rise apartment. Uh, might be low or medium rise apartment. You know, in my head, that's four stories or something. Or a townhouse or duplex. So maybe low to medium rise apartment over a townhouse, duplex or fourplex. Um, okay, how does that? How does that resonate for all you other guys that couldn't uh, participate in a mentee? Tend to agree, you know, somebody feels strongly about one of these types of residential housing versus the other. I uh, want to open it up for discussion and hopefully we can hear from people we haven't heard from, but Kavai, go ahead. You're muted. Can you hear me? Because you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just saying I'm, I'm a bit selfish in the sense of the fact that um, I favored the single turnkey um, over the uh, over the others. Um, however, I know that in Hawaii there is such a lack of availability of homes there that it makes it very difficult. Um, some of the things that are on there is a bit scary when you have, um, well, I guess nobody had chosen the, the um, uh, where was it? I can't read it anymore. Uh, multifamily high rise apartment. Yeah. Though, now don't get me wrong. I've been around to see many of those buildings being built, not just necessarily in Hawaii, but other parts of the, of the continent where they do have those. And crime seemed to be high. And maybe I am, uh, like I say, a bit selfish on that part, um, but I, I favor having the single turnkey um, more so than all the others. So that's, that's my opinion on it and what I, I think 
about all that's happening. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Anybody else? Maybe somebody that hasn't spoke yet, you know. How do these resonate with you guys? Anybody? Does it, I mean, does it seem about right? Maybe there's a mix of housing types on, on this, for this homestead community? <laughs> Alicia, go ahead. Well, you know what would really help, and I'm sure you guys have this, but I would love to see what you've built out on the island in all of these different homestead areas and what types of these options that you've provided and what has the demand been for? Has it, what is the demand for these types of options? That would be my question. I'm sitting here thinking, you know, Kapuna housing. I mean, I just, you know, we hear that all the time. and uh, I just took the dog of a lady that got sick in her housing in Nanakuli in a rental, uh, low income rental, and she ended up in the hospital. So I'm just think, sitting here looking at these options and I would not be one to, to live here, but maybe you guys could provide us with, you know, what are the numbers looking like, at least on the island of Oahu? What have you built out and what's popular? What's the demand? Mm -hmm. Um, we will get an update on the demand, I, th I think, in the survey that's going to be planned for next year. But, you know, this is not the first survey that the department has sent out. You know, so for Oahu, any of the department guys, you know, anything, any comments on this, this is This is Malia from okay. um, the, the Nahasta office at DHHL. Um, we have, as far as I'm aware of, only one Puna housing and it has a wait list of three years right now. Um, so we don't have anywhere near the amount of Kapuna housing that there is a demand for, but I don't have an exact number, but I do know the list is three years long. Um, all the units are full. Um, it is in Waimanalo. Um, so that's the only one that we have um, that I'm aware of on this island, but there is a demand for that. And Kapuna housing is something we hear um, a need for statewide also, you know, from beneficiaries. So this is, this is Lehua Kenny Laukano from the HHL. We did do a beneficiary study and applicant study um, in 2021. And generally speaking from those applicants who just responded very broadly to some of these questions, definitely the single family turnkey is the preference as was already suggested. Right behind that is the single family vacant lot. Um, we have been doing some of obviously both of those. The vacant lot can be a challenge. It's a lot of um, administration to go through. Some people may not be aware of all of those requirements, um, but definitely can be a niche for some people that may have some construction background. Um, we've done right with option to purchase here in Kapolei as well as in um, La Iopua in Kona. Um, it allows people <clears throat> to get into the home and eventually purchase that. Um, yeah. I'm not going to speak to the things Malia already covered. We will have a multifamily eventually when the Bolodrome site is built. Um, but generally speaking, going off of our numbers, our data is on our website. There is a preference for typically single family turnkey or single family vacant lot. So I just wanted to share that feedback. And you know what, I would just add that I thank you for that information. It's very important. But there is also a higher responsibility of DHHL to provide for the our Kapuna, especially with housing. And now that you've said, hey, we know that there's Raymond's been on the list for 20 years waiting for his home. And he might need that Kapuna housing, to be honest. So it just seems that somewhere in the planning with DHHL, regardless of whether or not people want it, you should be building it. So if I could just address that real quick, this is Lehua again. Um, DHHL will be issuing probably around February of next year. We'll definitely message it once it's once the program is set up, what is called a Kupuna rental subsidy for our Kupuna who are on DHHL's wait list to subsidize um, their rent because we may not have the units available. 
but we can subsidize. So they would pay no more than 30% of their income towards the rent and, and the federal funds we receive would subsidize the difference. So I just wanted to share that right now um, to hopefully address the kupuna. Um, I do see a question about what is the general cost now for housing on BETHL. I'm not sure if, um, if Daryl might have some of the information, at least for the Ka'ulo Kaha'i homes, which might have been the most recent on this island, and what the cost for those are. Oh, hi, yes, this is Daryl. Um, um, the Hua mentioned we did uh, recently build out our uh, phase 2B at uh, Ka'ulo Kaha'i, uh, single family, about 160 single family homes. Uh, roughly 130 of those were um, turnkey homes built by Gentry, and the range was roughly 300 to 450 thousand. Um, of course, that's uh, a lot, 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 lot lower than what you would uh, have to pay in the uh, open market, but that's primarily because uh, it is leasehold land. You're not paying for the the land itself, and you're also not paying for infrastructure. So in that sense, we are trying to keep the uh, uh, the cost down. And uh, we also encourage the developers. We go out with a general request for proposals from developers to give us their best shot at um, keeping their overhead and other construction costs down as much as possible. But um, that seems to be the, you know, really the rock bottom for the developers to make a, a fair profit, um, and probably not more than 5% uh, of the construction and development costs. Um, and again, in the, that uh, 350, maybe $450,000 range. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, thank you, Lehua. And uh, for those of you guys that have access to the chat, Andrew Troy posted a link to the last beneficiary survey that Lehua was speaking to. Thank you for that. I have a Anybody question. Anybody else? Uh, I have a no. question. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, why can't it be just multiple? All of these different things, the, the single family turnkey, maybe a few, the Kupuna rental housing, definitely. Um, you know, the single family turnkey can also be the rent with the option of purchase. But the I'm with Alicia, the kupunas, they deserve more than just my manalo. You know, three year wait list is bad enough that we have to wait so long, but look at how long they've been waiting. So why can't it just be multiple things that are that we're choosing from right here? It could. Yeah, that's good manalo. That, that's the type of manalo we wanna hear tonight. Um, in terms of how we start to plan out this community. So um, thank you for that. We, we will consider multiple um, product offerings as, we, this, look, well, as we look to develop and, and, the plan, yeah. How does that resonate with everybody on this call? You know, if there was a mix of housing, say there was a portion that was single family, some multifamily and maybe some kapuna housing mixed at this future homestead. Alicia, did you put your hands up? I, I missed that. Was that a oh a thumbs up? How many thumbs ups up out there? Okay, I saw Raymond's. Uh, good. Okay. It's good input. Michael, thank you. Seen that one. Kanoalani. Um Im Imkai? Imkai? Anyway. Okay, good. Uh let's see. I think we got some some good input, uh, at least on this question. Any last thoughts before we move into the next one, which will be community land uses? What kind of community land uses to, to add? Anybody going once? I see no hands. All right, let's look at the next oh, question. I think I see oh, a couple okay. hands. OK, OK. I sorry, think yeah. I someone iPhone, I they're waving their hand, but I don't have to do their name. I see that. Emily, your I hand up. <laughs> um, and who else had their hand up? Someone named Emily. iPhone. Emily, go ahead. Oh, iPhone. I see you guys. Okay. After Emily, you guys go. Emily, go ahead. Uh, my question is, how much um, does Hawaiian homeland 
have in Ever Beach? Um, this is the some... first subdivision in Ever Beach. Yes, yes, I think great. Yeah. Yes, this is the and first. And how many um, how many uh, units going to be built on this property? We don't know yet. To oh, be depending determined. on yeah what, right. what you decide. Yeah, and we're before we decide, uh, we right. want to and, and, collect uh, people's. Um, what is the home. timeline that we're looking at? Um, the timeline that we're looking at um, for this master planning and EA process is the fall of 2023. So um, hopefully within the next year, um, as Melissa had mentioned earlier, um, the this Eva Beach project is one of the projects that the department um, would like to utilize the $600 million that the legislature gave to us. So we hope that um, with that um, funding from the legislature that the timeline to um, engineer and construct an award will be accelerated. But right now I don't have a definitive um, timeline to when people will start to get awards. What I do know is that we hope to um, finish this phase of the um, homestead process, which is the planning and the environmental assessment process by next fall. Well, the reason I'm asking is because um, there is a timeline to use up some of that money also. So we need to uh, move along and also uh, we need to, <laughs> we need to uh, move things a little bit faster. And uh, I'm sure we're going to have several. Um, uh, yeah, you guys are going to be working on a lot of things. Um, up to 2025 so uh, good luck <laughs> mahalo thanks for the well wishes <laughs> good and it's 80 acres this site just a reminder okay iphone uh go ahead i see you guys yeah you gotta unmute yourself though you know emily she she uh asked the questions. All the questions that we were writing down and taking notes. So that was very awesome. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Uh, you got to meet yourself again, though. Uh, <laughs> um, Michael, uh, stressing the importance of Kupuna communities. I see that in the chat. Thank you for that. Um, you had a question about building Hawaiian homes in the Mililani and Waipio area. Um, maybe one of the DHHL guys can respond to that in the chat and we can move on to the next question. Unless Michael, you wanted to kind of clarify what you're asking about. No, this was, this was years ago. I thought I heard conversations from um, friends and family that work at DHHL that they're trying to get property up there. So I wasn't sure if that's you know, been talked about or if that's even a thing you know, there's money now that that's available just real quickly jared and other dhl staff please correct me if i'm mistaken but currently the department does not have lands in mililani or the ypo area um part of the 600 million we are looking to acquire more lands um, in especially on Oahu, um, the department um, is in the process of accepting offers from other landowners um, who are who might be interested in um, selling property to Oahu. I mean, to DHHL on Oahu. So we're in the process of seeing who is interested in um, um, providing land to DHHL um, on Oahu. And part of the 600 million could be used to um, purchase some of those properties, but we're still, um, we still don't know. And um, we're still going through that process to accept offers from other landowners. So who knows, maybe in the future, uh, we might have more lands on Oahu in different areas. Mahalo. Yeah, good question. Okay, let's, I don't see any hands. Let's, let's move into the next question. Uh, you know, we want to get your input on community land uses to include here. Um, playgrounds, sports fields or open fields, walking or bike paths, a community center, which could be for kupuna or kiki services or just gathering places. Um, 
community commercial land use, maybe a business, small business, uh, community ag or garden, cemetery, church. Um, one option is none to maximize housing or other. So the you know the trade off is always if you if you add more community uses or non residential uses that's less homes that go in into the development but it's always a balance that the department has the challenge of uh, trying to figure out with each community so um, I know you guys can essentially pick all of them if you wanted to in Menti but what we would like to know is what is the real priorities you know, it'd be nice to have all but what is the real priorities that you know the, the department should be considering community center so far it has the most votes that makes sense a lot of sense to us um, next we got some playgrounds um, walking and biking paths um, and about four each for sports fields and community garden uh, but by far the community center. So any, anybody that voted for that want to, you know, express to us why that was so important that you vote for it. iPhone, you guys had something. I see you two guys. You you want to say something about community center importance of that in the community? Yeah, for me, there's been some opportunities to build um, community center is um, something really vital to um, a, a growing area because we we all want to be community based and want to make sure that everyone in that area, you know, get along and can um, make sure that our children are um, getting everything that is needed for them as far as growing up and becoming one people you know um i i believe that it's really important as hawaiians that we get our children and our um adults and kupunas all together in one place where we make sure that everybody understand each other as one that way we can help other communities um in other homesteads to try to build the same thing it is uh it is very important because we are actually losing that as far as uh hawaiian people mm. that's all <laughs> emily go ahead um the community center is very important uh the reason is because the land that you're going to give um, for these homes are only 5,000 square feet. And that takes up three quarters of the house. And uh, there's no place to have parties. So when you have a community center, you have families that can, um, you know, invite their neighbors and have a party. So to me is the community center is part of the community where we can get together, even for uh, meetings, like uh, I belong to the Makaha Hawaiian Civic Club. Mm. So, you know, if you wanna have a meeting, you can go to the community center. Yeah, excellent. We're from Makaha too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why Nani and then Simothy? Um, okay, so my manat is gonna be a little bit different because um, I am Hawaii and I live in this community. And I was thinking like, that doesn't seem like a whole bunch of aina. So that's the come I was one of them that voted for that maximizing the housing. And like maybe DHHL can, can help to malama the, the places we already have. Cause we grew up here with other Pai Hawaii and other local people in our community. The people, many of us who grew up here have painas down at Pula Beach Park. Um, my brother then played basketball at the community parks already. And I kind of seen like all the different housing development coming up, they all make like their own little communities, their own little parks, right? And they're, it, they've become separate from our older community. You know what I mean? It's like, no, it doesn't really mix. So I just was thinking of that, like how you folks can just put into what, what is already in our community where our, you know, our Poet Hawaii isn't so separate because we grew up all together with everybody. Like all the families know each other. So it would be kind of sad if like the HSL is just so separate, but 
everybody has their painas down at Pula Beach Park mm. and plays at North Road Park, basketball, you know, all of that. So that's the come I was like, you know, that might take up more room from housing that can come up and more ohanas that could get a home. Just manao. Yeah, very good. I think we'd be looking at both. Sympathy, go ahead. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I just wanted to just add on to what she said, um, auntie and sister just said, but yeah, I mean, community centers, I grew up in Papukulea, so our community center is the center of our community. Um, I guess as far as the infrastructure, it does take up a lot since it's only 80 acres. But to think about it too, is that when families, just, especially you have families in Kupuna that can't travel and once they get home, you know, they got to cook and stuff. Just having that area for the families and the kids to participate in extracurricular activities, it just makes it a little more easier, like say like jujitsu classes or like having people coming into the community, talking to the families. It, I, I think it's not only builds a sense of community, but it makes it easier for working families in our kupuna. And that's it. Very good. Anybody else? How about any of these other ones? How about the playgrounds? I got a lot um, of, well, this, well, I guess walking paths and playgrounds. Anybody felt real strongly about either of those two? You want to share your mana on why? Or nice to haves? Uh, Alicia. I'm sorry, I don't know how to do that yellow hand on my computer. So that's the best I can do. I wanted you to know, I was the one that put other. Um, I did put walking oh. and biking paths. Um, so I I wanted to see if we could do a, <laughs> if you folks could do a, a dog park. And the, part of the reason why is because I actually run this little animal welfare nonprofit called Poi Dogs at Popoki. And we usually have this pet walk every year. I think we're gonna start it up next year. And so many people come with their dogs. It's 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 such a experience to be with your family and friends and neighbors, and all you have in common is your dog. And um, it really does build community, like like Kuu Vainani said. But I think especially in a new community like that, and the Hawaiians love their their pets. And uh, um, and by the way, you'll be hearing from me because we got a grant to spay and neuter dogs and cats of native Hawaiians. And, and that is because I feel so strongly about making sure that our animals are taken care of within this community. So I guarantee you, I'll be living across the street, keeping my eye on that homestead and make sure the animals are taken care of. But I would love to see a dog park. Thank you for that. I, I missed that other. And I definitely need to ask about the other other. But let's go to DHHL. I see the I hand up. Put in my, on that one. Uh, she did say that. Here's but dog, yeah, dog park. Dog. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, good. Wow, two volts for dog park. That's pretty good. How about who? Who was the other person that chose other? You want to hear what your your thoughts were on that? Um, iPhone. Is, is somebody trying to talk or raise their hand? Anybody want to share what the other idea was for community use? And this was two dog parks. Well, any, don't have to be other, but anybody else that haven't spoken yet want to chime in on the importance of any one of these community uses or having multiple? Raymond, your hand is up. Go ahead. Are you muted though? You still you still muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I um the community ag and garden. I, I like that because then you know. Um, you can go someplace, 
plenty of vegetables and you know of the sustainability of your you know obviously in your own uh, vegetables and fruits yeah so that's a good idea in that area as uh, for community garden and ag yeah so i just wanted to share them now mahalo thank you anybody else Anybody else? Should we move on to the next, the next topic, hazard zones? Yeah, why don't we do that? Let's go to the next question, Malachi. Uh, no menti on this one. So we have on the screen a couple of slides that we shared earlier showing the flood zones on the right side, um, the sea level rise exposure area, uh, it's called the Slarexa. So this is looking at what happens with 3.2 feet of sea level rise. And this was a study done uh, across the state. And it's also showing the tsunami evacuation zone as it stands right now. And the question we want people to chime in on is, you know, given these potential impacts to the Makai portion of the site, um, the impacts being from flooding, sea level rise, or potential tsunami, what types of uses should we put or not put into these areas that we should be considering for the alternatives? Any hands, any suggestions? And I, th I think we don't really want to put houses there unless there's a, a good reason, but, uh, or uh, mitigation, but how about some other uses for these, these types of areas? Alicia, go ahead. No, I, look, if we get tsunami, I'm, I'm underwater. I'm right across the street. Right. But have you, why don't you just plan like most of us who live down here and not everybody is smart, by the way, but why not put them on stilts? I know that's an old way of building, but that's why, that's why I'm three feet off the ground, my, mm -hmm. my house. So I don't, I don't understand. We need houses and there is risk, but you're telling me we're not going to build in those blue or purple areas because of a potential for tsunami is, is, is coming up off the ground three to four feet an option when you build. Yes. Then I say build. Yeah, oh, DJ Chow, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have a question. If we could, if you guys gonna build over there, what happens if the tsunami or yeah, the tsunami or break hurricane will like wash the like like put the water like we got water and um sand in our house and and we're not gonna be because we can't go nowhere because we're gonna be stuck and some of us don't drive and we have no zone to run up to the hill or yeah what would happen if a tsunami hit the south shore of Oahu um you know that that kind of calls into question the importance of access yeah. in and out of the site. You know, having multiple access points. Um, in this particular case, maybe one on the Malka side. Also, my but, husband and I have a disability, and we don't drive, and we're gonna be stuck in the house. So, and uh, we have no the only access is phone oh, and. Be underwater by then, so that's my my own mm. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, I feel like it's a help from first responders in, in that sort of instance too is important, and having them have the right access to the site is is good. Uh, why not? Why not? Go ahead. Okay, that's kind of, I am going to agree with what Alicia said, and I think it addresses that the wahine who just spoke. Um, I live right on the beach there, and our ohana lived through Eva and Iniki. So we dealt with the sand in our front yard, in our front, in our, in our house. 
Um, but like how Alicia said, right, we're building the houses above the ground. And um, um, I don't know if people know this, but our beaches actually got bigger. So where the parts of the island, the, the beaches got smaller and shrunk, ours actually got bigger. So I know that people talk about like the flooding and things like that, but this is my own observation from living here so long. Um, so to build it above, cause we've lived through all of that. And I guess another exit route would be on the North road side. Cause we lived through that. They would make the announcement and everybody had to go to Campbell high school. I mean, it would be more challenging cause more people, but right there, that's a whole bunch of homes on Ever beach road that would be wiped out. That's, that's like me and Alicia. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oye, vale. Good. Yeah. Um, what about if this is an opportunity to put uh, different kinds of uses there in, in the Makai side of the parcel, you know, so maybe it's like a garden or if it's left as open space, park space, um, you know, maybe not all houses. How does that, how does that resonate with, with anybody on this call? Or just build everything elevated, all elevated structures and maximize the amount of housing on this site. Hard to say. Anybody that hasn't uh, spoken yet? Raymond, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, this, this, hearing what she was saying about down there where they live, yeah. I mean, these people live down over there. You know, they, they get the first hand and they know, uh, you know, that area. So, um, I mean, if any Hawaiian home is going to build, are they going to build it on the ground, flat ground? Um, you know, are they going to improve the ground areas where uh, flooding and tsunami? Um, you know, just like in, uh, like she was saying, is uh, that Mott Road is the only access road to get out from that uh, area that size. I mean, you get all these houses in there, you know, how everybody going to get out? Yeah, it, it's going to two, one area that would be a safe area but you know what I'm hearing about these two ladies and they live in that area it's like wow you guys really got to take a look at this um, property that the uh, Hawaiian homes is going to build on you know, you know because I hear the concerns that what's going on and you know they live there so you know that's where the Manao stayed because they actually live there so they know what's going on you know mm -hmm. we don't know you know we're just trying to figure out uh why is this area right there in, in such a uh, you know low zone uh, for flood and, and tsunami and, and whatever you have? But there was this my concern on that. So uh, let me speak. Yep. Thank you. We should be getting some comments in the chat to uh, maximize housing on stilts or in a safe way. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, another comment: use that area for community center pool, playground, and dog park. That also makes sense too. So, you know, we're going to be taking all of this into account when we looking at alternatives, because that's part of the next step. And from my own experience too, as I'm planning working down in Elva Beach on shoreline stuff, Wainani's right that this beach is actually getting bigger. And in particular, because of the tea groins that went up at Iroquois Point, um, it seemed to have some impact on the sand retention in front of Elva Beach. That, that was what a study that I saw. Anybody else? I don't see any hands up. Okay, so you know, kind of, we just wanted to try and throw the idea out there, um, particularly what to do about the, the hazard zones in the future, you know, what what is appetizing and whatnot. Um, Want to get that idea in your guys' head because this is not the last time you're gonna see us, and or hopefully we do not the last time we see each of you to get your input. So, just giving you, you did idea wonderful, what we're Jared. Thinking. Oh, you did okay. wonderful. Good job. Oh, okay. Well, we still get about twenty six minutes left together, but thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we have two more questions. Well, actually, one more and then one general. You know, the rest of the time we can just take any mana that you guys have, but. Let's look at the, the next question. And this is back in Menti. 
So we're looking at transportation, accessibility, and connectivity. Um, so what street features are most important to you? Multiple access routes to the community, on-street parking, sidewalks, uh, off-street paths. So this would be like, you know, walking or bike paths, bike lanes. Access to public transportation, you know, bus stops, maybe um, access to eventually rail, traffic calming, so things like speed humps or having lower speed limits in the development or narrow, you know, smaller streets, people don't drive as fast, uh, safe crosswalks, street trees for shade or other. So hopefully you guys are still on Menti, you guys in, you know, the 12 or 15 or so of you guys that have been on Menti can got through this. Let's, let's check out to see what the results are. Okay, so about half of you got to this question. Uh, can I open for comment now? Anybody has any thoughts they want to share or why they chose a certain one of these options? Or for those of you guys not on Menti, you know, which one would you, which, which one or two or three is, is actually most important to you? Okay, I don't see any hands yet, but let's see. Traffic calming, so safety um, within the development. That's what that means to me. So, you know, implementing measures to keep people from driving too fast through the neighborhood. Sidewalks, um, That's that makes a lot of sense. Um, On-street parking is another one. So, you know, make sure there's enough parking in the neighborhood multiple access routes to the community. Okay. So sidewalks and traffic calming. So must be thinking about uh, Kiki in this, in this sense. Zero for off street paths and one other. What, what was the other? Who put the other in there? Uh, Multi-access and on-street parking. Okay, so more for that one in the chat. Who had the other? Anybody want to share? Am I missing you? Anybody want to share their thoughts in general on this question? Alicia, go ahead. Well, I just have to tell you, and I'm going to warn you, um, the DOT did a great job and they repaved Fort Weaver Road. It is now a freeway. Um, the folks that leave Puloa Beach Park, been there all day drinking and uh, they are, they're going 50, 60 miles an hour down Fort Weaver Road, right there where the homes are gonna be. So I would suggest, and I would say North Road is just as bad. So I would just suggest that when you guys start doing the planning, that you really do take into consider uh, consideration some kind of traffic calming initiative on both North Road and Fort Reaver Road that fronts the development because it's it's real it's really bad. Mm. Nice road, but yeah, you can yeah. drive over those speed humps pretty quick, fast too. You can kind of go over those things. I, I know. Yeah, but I would like to see them go over it and maybe take off, you know, five six mm. feet high and ruin their ruin their cars something. Yeah. Anybody else? The good. Thank you for that. So, would it make sense that you know having um, safe roads in and around the future homestead community and sidewalks um, makes the most sense? At least prioritize those things. Off street parking seems pretty important, so having adequate parking. Um, for this community. Sarah, go ahead. I see your hand up. You're, you're muted if you're talking. Maybe add some roundabouts to slow people down. That is a traffic calming 
measure and you know sometimes roundabouts actually perform better than stop signs or stop lighted yes okay. they have good the, question uh, they I mean, good have, answer. um a couple um bigger speed bumps by the elementary and the high school by boys and Gr boys and girls club they've mm -hmm. added that and it helped to slow people down so that's a good thing maybe when you oh. start developing for the new development for Homestead, maybe add that too, because we don't want a lot of traffic accidents in that area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good comments. And just my thoughts too, but lighting is important down there, you know, along Fort Weaver, it's pretty dark. So having good lighting um, also helps. And I think, you know, one of the aunties was commenting about the lighting importance um, earlier, but that kind of occurs to me too. Anybody else? Sorry, you still had something? Oh, no, no, I'm good. Okay, okay. This is good input on this. Um, How do I take off that? What else was there? So safe crosswalk, sidewalks, which is really important, traffic calming on street. Looks like these numbers are pretty, um, haven't changed too much. What about public transportation? Um, you know, actually like a bus stop or something like that. DHHL, go ahead. Um, yeah, the reason I put my stuff because some of us don't drive. And for the KP school, they need to go to school if they can catch the bus or have their um, bus and pick them up at the, at the, at the stop. Yeah. So we're thinking too. Um, bus pickup would be good for Kapuna and those that may not drive. Okay, yeah. Um, maybe add some roundabouts. Okay, I see that. Okay. Well, this was the last question that we had. Um, the, the last question that we actually have is any other ideas. So let's kind of open it up to any other questions you guys might have while you have the whole team, you know, on this call. Who's, oh, I gotta mute somebody, sorry. Um, you know, the whole team is here and we have, I don't know, about 15 minutes left. Does anybody have any other things that they wanted to bring up or share with us? Oh, it looks like I missed a question in the chat about community centers. There was a question, Malachi? Oh, if the community yeah. center, if the community center uh, enters these areas, will this community member be responsible for care of the facility? So who, who takes care of the community centers when they're built in homesteads? I think that's the question. Um, typically in other homestead communities, it's the uh, homestead association with who has the kuleana uh, to take care of the facility in the long run. Um, most of, I mean, most of the department's resources will be used for the development of the homestead lot. Um, in other communities, the um, community um, has taken on the kuleana of, um, not only just maintaining centers, but also in some communities, uh, they have the capacity to um, go out and fundraise and plan their own community center. So they do take a lot of ownership um, of their of their um, gathering space uh, in other homestead communities. Thank you, Andrew. That was a good question too. Yeah, I like the question. Anything else? Let's see, I don't see any, any other hands. Am I missing you? Wave your hand. 
No. Anybody else? All right, let's go to the Mahalo slide. A couple of things on there I wanted to share with you guys. Just one more, uh, one more question popped up from oh, I'm sorry. Sarah. And then, uh, yeah, one question about whether there'll be ma monthly maintenance fees for the community centers, I guess maybe generally for the community. It's a question for DHHL. We don't know the answer to that question yet. Um, we, um, in certain homestead associate, certain homestead communities, uh, the association does charge um, a fee to help upkeep the community asset. Um, in other communities, the association has found other means of financing. Um, so that's a very good question, but unfortunately we, we don't know yet. Um, we don't know the answer to that. Okay, it will question. it will largely depend on um, the preferences of our future homestead lessees in the area. Thank you, Michael. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I may have missed this in the beginning. Um, but what's the timeline like? When are you guys anticipating the first houses being built? Um. We did go over kind of the timeline for this planning and environmental assessment pro process. Um, we hope to be finished with this planning and environmental assessment process by the fall of 2023. Um, we have to we have to do this in, in, before we get to um, engineering design, um, construction, and award of lots. Unfortunately, I can't forecast what the exact time frame is going to be for award of the lots. Um, we have to get through the planning process, then we have to get through the engineering design process, actual construction, and then the award of lots. But what I can say is we hope to um, expedite this because of the um, allocation that the legislature gave us uh, recently. So a lot of times the delay in the department's development has been because of a lack of funding, but um, we hope to utilize um, a portion of the 600 million to help expedite this 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 process forward. Yeah, good question. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Jared. I can give a general timeline um, for uh, engineering and designs, uh, getting county subdivision approvals and construction plan approvals. It is probably about um, anywhere from a year and a half to maybe three years for a really complex uh, project. And after that, uh, probably another, uh, for, for something this side and another two, maybe two and a half years for infrastructure construction. Uh, and then we can start uh, building houses. So once the planning and, um, planning and environmental assessments are done, uh, I, I give a rough estimate of four to six years before houses can start. Thank you, Daryl. Yeah, that's good input. And I can answer, there's another question in the chat about the flood zone, but I was hoping if maybe you could put back the slide that shows the, um, the various um, hazards. Yep, oh, that's the one. Um, so if you look at the map, the area that is in the flood zone that requires insurance is VE, and that's the one on the right, the orange. So um, there's none of the DHHL lands are in the flood zone that require flood insurance. Um, so the areas that we do see that go into the parcel are the areas of sea level rise, which is different from a tsunami or a hurricane. Um, and so at this point in time, there's not insurance requirements if you're in an area like that. I, I, I can't say that there won't be in the future, but that is the estimated rise of sea level um, that has nothing to do with a tsunami or a hurricane or something like that. That's just where the sea level will be at in say 30 years. So I hope that answers your question with the flood insurance. That was good. Any other questions? I see no hands. Um, thank you for that. 
Missing anybody? All right, um, next slide. This is our last slide of the night. Uh, so this is our mahalo slide. You know, I do appreciate everyone's time. Um, we do encourage everyone to get to the project website uh, through the DHHL website, I suppose. And you can use that QR code here to get to it. Um, please sign up for the mailing list so that we, we can keep you guys informed, you know, all of our moves. Um, also feel free to contact Perlene or Melissa May from our office. Their contact information is up on the screen there, uh, emails or phone, phone numbers. Um, and be on the lookout for the survey that comes out, you know, early next year sometime. But, but please stay in touch with us. And we do hope that everybody continues to participate in the beneficiary consultations or the community meetings that we're gonna be having um, in person in Eva Beach. And any last questions? No. Um, any, any last thoughts from the DHHL team on the line today? You know, I do appreciate all of you guys too. You guys provided a lot of good information to the questions. Um, there was one last um, question in the chat. Um, yes, if you got a mailing card from the department, you um, you are on our um, mailing list for, um, uh, you are an applicant on the DHHL um, waiting list and we, and that's how you, you got the, um, the card. So um, we, we do have your contact information. And I just want to clarify, so, we have our beneficiary consultation meetings, which is what we are doing tonight. Our beneficiary consultation meetings are specifically targeted to our waitlist applicants on the island of Oahu. Um, as the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, we have a fiduciary responsibility to reach out to our beneficiaries before others. But we do acknowledge and we do want to respect um, our new neighbors in the Eva Beach community. And that is why we are also going to reach out to um, the larger Eva Beach community in the future. But tonight um, was, we wanted to start with our beneficiaries because that is who our trust is meant to serve first. Um, but we will be reaching out to the larger Eva Beach community um, to get more mana'o on how we can have a um, homestead community that um, doesn't cause a significant impact to the larger community. Yeah, thank you for that. There was another question from Sarah. Approximately how many homes are we looking at? Um, for this new homestead community? We don't quite know yet. Um, so by the end of this planning process, by the next fall, we should have a better idea of what the um, number of homes are, what type of homes they will be, um, and the different types of potential different types of products that we might, um, might be a part of this development. Yeah, but you. your, your folks, yeah, your folks mana'o uh, tonight definitely helps us uh, have a good starting point um, as we go through this planning process. Agreed. Anything else, Berlin? Anything? Yeah, I'd really like to say thank you to everyone. You know, it's been um, a really good two hours and a lot of good thoughts and concerns. Um, questions uh, were raised and that's exactly what we wanted to accomplish for this first beneficiary consultation. Um, I would like to just kind of say, please keep in contact. If you go to our website, you can sign up for emails and you can also um, put any additional thoughts and questions that you might have for the team. So as you think about it tonight, as you talk to your families, your neighbors, you know, you can always, um, reach out to us by just sending it uh, through the website. Um, so thank you everyone. I think we, it was a very successful evening of a lot of information and a lot to um, digest. Uh, we will be putting up the presentation as well as a meeting recap as well on the website. Um, and I highly encourage you to you know, go and visit that. But again, just, Thank you so much to everyone. Okay, and with that, we're gonna close the meeting. I uh, just wanna say everyone be safe this holiday and hope you guys all have a great holiday season. Aloha. Mahalo. Aloha, mahalo. Aloha, mahalo. Aloha, Aloha. 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 Aloha.
Oke. Okay. Halo, halo. Oke, Halo, halo. 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 Halo, halo